Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this episode of the show, I'm speaking with Baron McKay of Pepperwool. Baron is a Knife World design veteran who, a few years back, was at the forefront of a major Knife World rebranding, creating designs that single-handedly wrenched this company from the clutches of big box store design cheesiness. He's since left that company and is creating his own brand, set to launch in the near offing. He sent me a copy of one of the folders he intends to launch the brand with, and not only do I recognize his design language, but I'm very impressed with the charm, practicality, and ease of carry of this of his solo work. We'll meet Baron and talk all about the advent of Pepperwool, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, share the show with a friend. Also, if you want to help support the show in a monetary fashion, you can do so by going to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. Baron, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. It's great to have you. It's great to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I, I want to, before we start, I want to congratulate you on uh, your taking this step into the abyss and launching your own brand. Uh, not only do I admire it, but uh, man, I, I admire your work. So congratulations, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. All right. So uh, in my introduction, I was a little, you know, mysterious, but uh, you really, really did with your designs. I'm thinking of three in particular um, with your imagination and love of knives kind of turn that company around uh with the help of others of course uh, oh, yeah. but let's let's talk about it that uh, what company am i talking about and what are those models <laughs> are you talking about sog knives uh and i'm gonna i like to tell stories so i'm gonna give you a little brief story of kind of how a lot of the the turnaround happened because i think it'll help kind of illustrate a lot of where we go with pepperwool too um, I had this experience where I think it was like in 2016, 2017, where I uh, was doing a planning meeting with the, the product development team. And I asked the team, we were, I was doing a whiteboard session. I asked the team, I was like, so what's, uh, what's your favorite SOG knife that you want to carry in your pocket that you show your friends and everything else? And I literally got silence as a response. Mm. <laughs> and I remember like putting down uh, the the whiteboard marker and just sort of sitting there going like, you know, if if the people here that are designing the knives, designing the products, don't want to talk about it, don't want to share it, I was like, that's a huge problem. we got to change that. And so right then and there, I was like, okay, let's just, we're just wipe off the board. Let's start from scratch. What do we want in a knife? What's going to be something that we can like really care about and be excited about? And we started developing that knife, right? And that's really what became sort of the the turning point, I, I believe, was at least the starting point of that, that turnaround that you're talking about uh, with the company. And that, that first knife that uh, that we did that with is actually the Terminus, uh, Terminus XR. Oh, OK. So anyway, and then as you see, as we developed into like, you know, getting more kind of refined with the marketing and everything else like that with, you know, using with Jonathan and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, we started developing, like, say, the brand new assistive technology with the flashy, just Trident. Um, also, uh, one of my, I guess, supreme pleasures in life was uh coming up with a new otf mechanism right this guy Ooh. which was a lot of fun uh this is something i worked on for years and years and years and, and during that same time period is able to kind of bring this guy out i love the fact that it doesn't wiggle right um but that was something else that, that i had a lot of fun coming out with and there's just a lot of great knives i think the favorite knives i ever had at sog came from that latter end of the period from about 2017 on until uh, the company got sold right so it was a lot of fun. Great products, though. Uh, we we had Jonathan Wegner on the show a few years back, and uh, I know he was a lot on the marketing end, kind of on the f the yeah. forward facing uh, side of things. Um, and 
for me at the time, I was so thrilled to see this because I'm an old time SOG lover, uh, the, mm -hmm. the Mac V SOG fixed blade and, yeah. and all of the, um, stacked leather handled, uh, kind of traditional combat classics that SOG, uh, yeah. has made throughout the years was what drew me in. But then there are folders, uh, also my, my very first tactical folder was in 1991. It was a, a it was a SOG from way pre the, these yep. days and to see to see that brand come back with your designs was really exciting because um well because frankly uh it, to my eye it went down kind of a uh a very um a billboarded kind of road you know everything kind of had yeah. the, and it's very interesting what you say about that meeting where it kind of people are like well i just work here uh, in a way yeah. um um I want to get to the OTF mechanism because I, I didn't know this. We, we need to talk about that in a second about the no wiggle thing, because you never hear that from anyone except a G and G Hawk, you know, you're in for oh, yeah. 2000 bucks. If you want to no wiggle OTF, we'll talk about that in a second. But what, what was your, uh, when you had that whiteboard session and no one mm -hmm. spoke up, what was your first thought? Where does this company need to go aesthetically? Well, I think the, the the main first thought I had is is I I agreed with the sentiment because <laughs> at that point we had been building an awful lot of I, I think that the push at the time was to basically make as much as we could uh, from a product standpoint and not really think about it too much but just say hey look we got price points and pegs to fill let's just let's just fill it all up and just just get out there and it was a it was a crazy time because you had huge workloads and not a lot of kind of help to get the job done. Um, and as a result, I think a lot of the things we put out, it was amazing that we were able to put out as much as we did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think for me, I, I, I talked about this kind of internally with the team. It, it just, for me, it kind of lacked a little bit of soul, if that makes any sense. That makes and, a lot and it of just sense. made me feel like, like, you know, it's like, I, I want to have something that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to impart a bit of myself into, that I'm going to be excited about, that I'm going to care about. And a lot of the stuff we were putting out at the time didn't have that, right? Uh, and at least not for me. Uh, and so uh, that's where I think that the the big transition came and we're like, yeah, let's let's actually put something that's got some life to it, right? Something that that means something. And you know, when Jonathan came on board, I think uh, a couple of years later, he really helped a lot with that. Like he and I worked together very closely on trying to make a lot of these things happen uh, from the rebrand to uh, getting a lot of sort of the visuals, as you saw, the visuals changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the style of the knives, uh, I got to explore a whole lot of, uh, a lot of my passions that I had at the time, which is like exploring better knife seals, uh, improving lock mechanisms with like uh, getting into sort of the, the bar lock systems. Um, it was just, it was phenomenal. I had a lot of fun with that. I, even like pushing the boundary to what was possible from a sheath standpoint. For years and years, people hated our sheaths, right, on the fixed blades. And, you know, being able to spend time and, and energy thinking about like, how could you make a better sheath? How could you get it slimmer and, and smaller and more compact so it wasn't so bulky? Uh, it was just a lot of fun uh, to do a lot of that stuff. So yeah. I had I had a blast. Speaking as a daily fixed blade carrier, but in a uh, discreet way, that mm -hmm. that means a lot because oftentimes the sheath feels like an afterthought. And if yeah. you're creating uh, the sheath, of a fixed blade, like you're creating the handle of a folder, I think you're kind of on the right path. And, uh, you know, because it, it all has to fit in your pocket or your pants or whatever. So were you always a knife guy uh, or, or a product design guy? How did that happen? Oh, man, my background's a weird one. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I engineer by training, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I first, uh, got into sort of computer science and robotics and stuff like that. And so like my undergraduate work uh, was actually mechanical engineering, but it was a focus in mechatronics, which is a combination of computer science, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. And basically I was uh, building sort of robotic structures and whatnot like that. I then um, went in to do graduate work and I got a master's degree in what's called control theory, which is basically creating all the very complicated mathematical algorithms that would control uh, electric motor motion, right? How, how it moves from one location to another one. And then I worked on a PhD in um, also mechanical engineering, but it was focused on nano and micro uh, bots, basically. I was making 
uh, some of the the fundamental elements of like little nano, nanites that you would see. And so like they've got research papers out there that talk about that. And and you can kind of I would work on the propulsion system mainly uh, of how do you actually make these things swim through the body or swim oh through a, a, something like that. So that's my my educational background. Right. Uh -huh. um, but I had a passion for doing product development because while I was going to school, I was also working and I, and I got an engineering job, I think, after my first quarter of, of engineering school. I applied for an internship. I got it. And then they liked me so much. They said, hey, you know, work night and weekends and holidays. And I was like, great, I can make money while I'm going to school and pay for it that way. So I got exposure to a lot of, uh, you know, product development work uh, doing that. And I loved it. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, in that case, it was actually doing the photo, uh, like it was the photo industry is where I was. Um, <laughs> The sad part about that is, of course, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, digital cameras became very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so people stopped doing a lot of photography in the more traditional sense. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I learned a lot from that and I got a, a real feel for that. So when I I was kind of ending the, the PhD program, I, I had this sort of crossroads where all of a sudden it was like, do you want to become a professor or do you want to do something else? And I'm like, you know. Uh, I have a brother that, that was a physics professor and he and I talked about it and he's like, do you want to grade papers for the rest of your life and write research <laughs> papers? And I was like, I was like, you know, I could do it. I'm, I, I'm good at teaching. I'm good at kind of interacting with the students. Cause I've done some of that as a, as a research assistant, as a teaching assistant, but, um, and I got great reviews from students, but I just was like, you know what, that's, that's going to bore me to tears long-term. I was like, I'd rather be able to do something where I can learn about sort of people's problems and help solve them and really do it in a, in a meaningful way. And I think that's where, like, especially SOG really uh, in the latter years when Jonathan got involved, where we were able to actually start interviewing like consumers and people that are actually using the product mm. and really understand kind of what they what they were needing and what they needed from a, from a product itself. Like, how do we solve the problem? How do we really get into this? And it was fantastic because, like, you know, you got into the psychology of it, you got into the functional elements of it. And, and I really got to kind of explore. And that's really what I wanted to do from a, a product development standpoint. So I finally got to kind of realize or at least start to realize that dream. Uh, and I, I'm glad I made the choice. I think making the choice though, changing from, you know, the professor route to being, you know, just a uh, design engineer was was a tough one. And it was it was a hard transition for me. But uh, once I got into it, I uh, looking back on it, it was the right choice for me. Uh, was there some um, conflict between the relative theory of working on nanobot propulsion and uh, like actual product design that might be made next year? Um, yeah, so basically transitioning from doing an R&D only to being like more development, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I would kind of classify it. So in R&D land, sky's the limit. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, you're just burning through money, trying stuff out. You're trying to, to push the boundary of what's possible and, and getting into, you know, you're just running up debt for the most part. But hopefully at the end of it, you've created some new tech and that's fantastic. Versus like a more development role where all of a sudden you've got schedules, you've got people that need to, to have like timelines that you adhere to. It's like, hey, I've got a brand launch, we've got to do this, we've got sales where they have to get samples in at this date and, and this time. And, you know, a lot of project management goes into it. It is different, right? Because now you have to be very regi regimented and kind of controlled mm -hmm. uh, versus before you're just like, yeah, I'm showing up, I'm doing my thing. I've got an idea, I'm going to throw spaghetti on the wall and see if it sticks. You know, it's a, it's two different kind of elements of, of the same coin, really. But uh, one of them, you have to have a lot more kind of discipline than the other one. If you think about it, it's kind of like you went from designing the newest, absolute newest tool. Actually, it's not even probably happening yet, but it's right in the offing. It's like a, a new technology. And mm -hmm. then you end up actually... Um, you know, kind of finding yourself creating the oldest tool, a newer version of the very oldest tool. You know, you go from nanotechnology to blades. Yeah. That's a that's a huge jump backwards, well, but forward if you really think about it. Oh, the so okay. I have a lot of fun though with it because I like during my time at Saga, I got to invent all sorts of really interesting things, at least things that I thought were interesting. Um, and the fact that there was room in the space to create new technology was surprising to me because like you're right it's one of the oldest tools of mankind and yet the fact that hey i got room to really expand and, and kind of push the boundaries of what's possible and invent something new was uh, it was exhilarating and a lot of fun too right so um a kind of a fun thing i i do have a 
<laughs> I don't know if you want to get too much into it. You, you can you can censor me on this one. Sure. No. But there there are some really fun little little inventions that I that I got a kick out of. Like one of the first ones that I, I had a, a huge blast at at Sog was uh, I don't know if you know the knife called the Slim Jim. Yes, I know. Um, I have a Slim Jim, the large one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's With super the folded thin, over. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is a, it's a brand new assistive technology, right? So it, that didn't exist. Uh, that was something that I actually came up with and invented. And I have like a proof of concept model actually here at my desk uh, of the very first thing that I kind of crudely put together to try and make it. Because the cool thing about it is that, at least I think it's kind of cool from a mathematical or geometry standpoint, is that it just uses the leaf springs and the leaf spring actually pushes on the wrong side of the pivot. So if you actually take the knife apart and you look at it, you're like, that shouldn't physically be possible. And it has this kind of mathematic kind of element to it where all of a sudden like the blade closes and you're like, How, what, what keeps it shut? How does it do that, right? And it's all captured with sort of a fancy bit of geometry that I put in there, right? So it's, it's things like that I thought were kind of fun and interesting because the challenge was, could you make something super thin and still be assisted? And I, that was something that Spencer Fraser actually kind of hit me with uh, when I was sitting in his office one day. He's like, hey, he's like, can we do like, a really thin assisted knife and can we do it like with just like one single piece of sheet metal as a handle and i'm like i'm like yeah let me think about that for a little bit let's see if we can if we can figure that out and uh and there you go you got it now it had some problems with it because you know i think the at the time as you as you mentioned earlier it was like push everything out the door as quickly as you could right mm -hmm. uh and we were able to kind of adjust a lot of those things later on in production but uh, a lot of that time period is like, yeah, it's like I would come up with these new kind of interesting ideas or creative uh, solutions. And then, you know, maybe some of them need a little, little bit more time, a little bit more refining. But uh, it was something that was new and different and exciting for me to play with. Well, from between the old days of SOG, like the 90s and, and before that, to uh, the rebranding where we had all these beautiful new versions of old knives coming out, yeah. uh, the Slim Jim was my absolute favorite. And I, I have mine. It's a, a four and a quarter inch. It's the large That's one. The big one. And uh, I love that knife. It's, it's really probably... I, one of the very few assisted knives I still have, you know, I, I went down that snob lane where I was like, I don't need assisted, but I love that knife. Um, and Spencer Frazier, just for people who, who uh, Frazier, who don't know, he's the guy who started SOG, uh, yeah, right? The founder. Uh, um, the founder, uh, there's some great interviews with Nut and Fancy. He did a great interview with Nut and Fancy many years ago. Um, that's where I learned about him. But uh, that's... Uh, to me, that's really interesting because you're coming at uh, like this old tool from an from a new perspective, and uh, you know you're you're you mentioned control theory. I don't know what that is, but uh, <laughs> what is that? It's basically uh, if you were, I'll put it like this: if you if you have like a like an arm like this, and it has like a, an electric motor on it, and it moves, you are trying to, uh, you're creating a mathematical algorithm that's going to control how it moves. So that like, if you just if you just normally turned it on and it just went, it would go like this and then it would start to shake probably, right? Cause it would go kunk like that. Mm -hmm, okay. If you wanna have a controlled motion where it just goes like poof, like that, you actually put in uh, feedback loops and also feed forward loops or, or adaptive control. These were like uh, algorithmic kind of ways of, of mathematically controlling it. And you actually make a, um, you do a matrix is what you end up end up with all the equations you can capture into a matrix and that captures all the dynamics of what's going on with it so you feed all that information into it and then you apply these mathematic uh, algorithms to it to get it to move the way you want it to in a very smooth and controlled fashion uh, so if you're doing like like if you're making a, like a cnc machine or something like that all of the motors will have to have this type of uh smarts in it to control the motion and to make sure that it's smooth and, and easy going. Or another thing that's interesting is like if, you, if you're familiar with like a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, like a VTOL. That's so funny, yes. Um, like I, I did that as, I remember uh, one of my final problems, I worked on that with uh, my professor at the time, phenomenal guy. Uh, he's like the founder of the feed forward uh, algorithmic approach. Uh, really great guy, but he, he had me work on this VTOL problem. And the thing that's fascinating to me about that one, it's a very complicated problem of how an aircraft can vertically take off and, and go. Uh, most people don't know this, but there's actually a certain uh, angle at which it mathematically becomes incredibly unstable. And so like mathematically, you should not be able to do that. 
how you compensate for in the real world is you very quickly go through that angle. <laughs> so as the plane is taking off, there's a certain point where if they stay at it too long, it'll just, it'll, it'll That's... catastrophically fail. So they have to very quickly transition from one to the other one to make sure that the plane can move. I, I think that's goes. why the Osprey and the, and the F-35 uh, Mar Marine Corps version that has the VTOL and the, and the, yeah. you know, the, the, uh, the Osprey, the, the big propeller thing that turns from a helicopter into an airplane. Uh, that's why they had problems and, and crashed so yeah. much and took so long to get to market is yeah. that, that part. Uh, I, I only know that cause I produced some military shows back in the day, but, um, what an awesome bit of tech, right? Oh my I mean, God. So cool. It is cool. All right. All right. Let's talk about something else cool. And yeah, I'm yeah. holding it right here in my hand. And this is, this is the knife that you are releasing. And um, actually, I'm frankly, I'm not sure what stage of release this is in, but it's live on the site. So people can oh, actually go and buy it right now. Gracious. I, yeah. I love this. You sent this to me. Thank you, by the way, yeah. uh, to check out. It is awesome. It is. First of all, I see your design language in it, and I really, really like your design language. That's what got yes. me back interested in SOG. Uh, frankly, I sort of gave up. And then I started a lot of people did the new stuff come out. And from looking at this, I know you had so much to do with it. Uh, tell us about this knife and the Merino series. Yeah. So uh, one of the, like, remember how we talked about problems? Mm -hmm. One of the problems that uh, I always kind of noticed after having like, you know, I've been in the knife world for about 15 years and uh, 12 of that was with SOG. And of course, the last three years, I've actually still been in the knife world working with people. But I've seen a lot of amazing knives. I mean, really great knives. And you get them, you buy them, uh, you, uh, you love them, you put them in your pocket. And then um, uh, what happens with me is that like after a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months, you know, you get the sore butt because it's in your back pocket and you're sitting in the car driving somewhere or like, you know, you try and put your hand in your front pocket because it kept it there, but all of a sudden, like, there's not enough room and you're trying to get your phone out. You're like, oh my gosh, this doesn't work. And eventually, the sad news is that it would end up on my dresser. Hmm. And, you know, the best knife you have is the knife that you carry with you. And if you can't carry it with you, what good does it do you, right? And so I saw this as a problem. I was like, this is a, this is a major issue that I'm like, how do I make a knife that is super carryable? And if you remember back in SOG days, uh, we had one um that I actually worked on from uh it was the ultra this guy mm -hmm. right and um what came about with this one is I actually had an ultralight hiker that was like hey can you design a a knife that's like under an ounce and and like got an actual usable blade and so this one came about what i found though is that this guy i would carry this around all the time and i was like why do i carry that around all the time how how is it that it, i just never get tired of it and the answer was, it's, it's super thin, it's super light, it just fits mm. in the pocket and it disappears. And I was like, could I take a lot of the things that I have done with other knives that I love, like you know the bar lock, uh, the kick deploy, the fact that it is, is a strong, reliable knife, because this one actually is, is a little bit flimsy, right? I mean, it has like kind of some, some structural issues that makes it a little bit flimsy. Could I make all of the good things that I want into something that is super carryable? And that's where I was going with, with that Marina line is like, could I do like a, a family of knives that then solve that problem and making something that, that just seamlessly fits into your pocket, almost like a ghost where you don't even know it's there, but when you need it, you can just pull it out. And that's, that was the, the idea uh, that I had with, with Merino. And this is the first one that I came out with it. It's the, the micro size one, right? This little tiny one. And my idea with this is that like the ultimate carry, the ultimate thing that's going to like. Uh, be in your pocket that you're you're always going to carry and and just never forget is if you could fit this in your fifth pocket, right? The, the mm. little coin pouch, and so that's where where I designed this one, and it, it actually fits uh, nicely in, in that pocket, even in in girl jeans. Believe it or not, <laughs> my wife put it in, and she was like, <laughs> she was like, nothing fits in girl jean pockets. She's it's like, but true. this thing does, right? And I'm like, oh, it's amazing, right? So, uh, so that was what the main idea was, and I and I also love uh, I love the fidget factor, right? I mean, oh, it's man. just it's just fun to play with. And it's strong. Uh, it's it goes up to. Uh, I think the last time I did destructive testing on this one, I was able to get it up to almost about a thousand pounds before the Whoa. lock. Whoa! You yeah, mean against against the lock? You mean like hanging? Yeah. Weight? So against the lock. So oh, if you if you have it like this in the three point bend situation, and you actually push right here at the lock, uh -huh. uh, it's going to take roughly you know a couple hundred, like seven eight hundred pounds, something like that. 
um, you know, and it's it's amazing on such a small thin knife that you could do that, right? So. Well, it, it's funny you mention uh, your wife and girl jeans because uh, uh, this does fit perfectly in my fifth pocket. And also, uh, I find that fifth pocket knives, when you sit down, can be uncomfortable uh, yeah. because of the bend of the hip and all that. But this is not, and I think it might have to be, it might have to do with the thinness of it. You say it's about the width of four house keys or so. And uh, yeah. it is thin and it sits shallow. I showed this to my wife when uh, it showed up and she's like, hmm. Oh, you don't say, and I'm because she's a she's a knife carrier. That's one of the ways we yeah. met, um, and uh, she loves the design of this and the size of this. I informed her that this is mine because it's part of the stable. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's I think the the okay. Uh, we have people like me who carry three, four knives a day. I mean, sure. some of the people uh, that tune into the show carry a lot more than that. But oh yeah. If you don't, and most people don't, you should still have a knife. This is the message I uh, I impart to everyone, including my my work friends and everything. I've got everyone that I work with over the last fourteen years carrying knives. Everyone everyone's got a knife at my office, and some I know prefer something small and out of the way because I'll say, "Where's your knife? I don't see your clip." And they're like, "Oh, well, it's too big." Uh, so a lot of people prefer the small, um, pocketable knife. This definitely does that. It's S35EN cryo treated. It's like really nice steel so far. I mean, I I've done some stuff with it. Not nothing to. I've not hung a thousand pounds from it, <laughs> uh, but it is super durable. All of us knife junkies do all this and do the twisting and everything, and it seems super durable. Uh, I I think you've kind of hit on a little. Um, on kind of a magic mean here because it's small but strong. It's got all like really excellent materials. Tell tell us about the selection of materials and yeah. uh, and and how you went about that. Uh, I've uh, just to preface it. I've seen some of the research you've done on some of the larger merino. I I think the SM you call it. Yeah, well, I've got a couple. So I mean, I can okay. I can I can show them. Actually, I've got them oh, here. Okay, like cool. this this is the uh, this is like the DM. So is it the daily DM, size? Sorry. The uh, yeah, the the two letter acronym I've got is like manual micro or MM, right? Would be this one. Uh, this would be like the daily manual or the DM. Mm -hmm. And I have a series of other sizes. This one is super thin. I've got other ones that uh, I actually haven't physically shown to anyone. I don't think, but I can I can show you guys one of those, right? You're, you're all yes, like yes, drug. exclusive. Um, but like you know, this one is is a big one. This is like a four something inch, but you can mm -hmm. also see it's a lot mm -hmm. thicker. So if you look at from like the the dimensional size of these guys, I don't know if you can kind of see that. But this is this is substantially thicker, but still very thin. Uh, this is actually probably thinner than a spider coast still, uh, but like this one, like the the break free, break force I got on the lock was closer to like three thousand pounds. So oh it's it's God. a beast, right? Uh, but the nice thing is that it's still super carryable, right? And uh, it's a little bit heavier too, right? I mean, like, you know, you get a little bit more heavy. But if, you, if you're if you someone who is demanding, who needs like a lot of strength, that's why I made something like this. Because then it's like, yeah, you can get the use out of it. Um, so, yeah, it's a whole family of different uh, different kind of knives. Hopefully, if, if things keep going well, I can release the rest of them. And I've got like, I got a bunch of prototypes here too of other fun stuff I've, I've been working on. Uh, I'm not going to show you any of those things right now, but like hopefully in the future I can because it's, you know, there might yeah. be an OTF in the future. Maybe. Who knows? Right. Ooh, well, uh... we won't talk about that. But there's a lot of other kind of cool tech that I, I've been working on that uh, I think is exciting and interesting and and will do do good things. Right. So um, just to kind of give an idea of, of kind of the scope of, of where I'm kind of going with it. But, yeah, I understand that like this might be a little bit too small for some people. And that's why I wanted to do these other knives that I think are, are going to be you know, fit, fit the different niches that, that people like. Uh, if I forget, I want to get back to the OTF mechanism that you created for SOG because yeah. I have a feeling it might play into your uh, uh, the stuff you're going to come out with. But uh, I, I want to talk about uh, the materials here on, oh, the, yes. M on the MM. Uh, it's so light. Uh, yeah. But really, it's got a very solid feel to it. And, uh, you know, I can, I can see that it's got weight relieved steel, uh, it inset steel liners and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, tell us about the materials and how did you manage to get this so light, <laughs> even with steel liners? Yeah, so it has full steel liners in it, which is one of the nice things. Um, and they are, I did cut out some weight re reduction in there. I had spent a lot of time kind of looking at sort of the structural analysis of a lot of knife handles. Uh, and trying to figure out like how do I make something that um, 
basically almost like an I-beam of in a building. Like how do you get the greatest strength with like the least amount of material going into it? And so when you look at the liners, you'll notice that they uh, they actually have that kind of structure. I, I lightened up some areas of it, uh, but I also add, added strength to others. Uh, I do use a very thin liner in there, and mainly because uh, I use that, a lot of the weight is reduced because a lot of the weight in a knife handle it comes from the liners themselves. Um, if you remember kind of back at SOG, uh, I also came out with this idea of using a kind of carbon fiber liners. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever remember that. Yes, like yes, on the, on the Kiku XR, I know you did. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one also had it too. Um, and what you'll notice with that is that you ended up having uh, a lot of the structural uh, strength because the carbon fiber still gave that to you, but a huge weight reduction. Yeah. So with this one, I was like, can I do that with steel? Uh, and, and actually what I discovered is that if I pair it with G10, uh, and I use a little bit of the structural integrity of the G10, I can get that same kind of level of strength yeah. as I kind of combine those two together. So I, I chose G10 specifically because uh, not only am I using it as, as a nice handle material, because I like the I like the feel of it. Uh, I like the the way that it kind of is super environmentally protective. Like I mean, like you can run G10 through just about anything. It's going to be super nice and, and come out looking great, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted it from the structural integrity of it because it's in, at its base, it's a bunch of fiberglass with some resin in it, right? So that I can use as a composite material and I can get some strength out of as well. So the combination of the, of the steel with the G10 handles produces that very strong handle that you need for the lock and for everything else. Could I do that if I change the handles as something other than G10? It wouldn't be as strong unless you know I had some like titanium or something else like that, right? But in this in this particular case, like yeah, that's how I got a lot of the strength to weight ratio going. Uh, the no, no, sorry, go ahead. You sure? Okay. Uh, the other things that I, that I was kind of looking at too, like you you commented on kind of like the the blue color, right? It's a titanium nitride coating on the outside of that. Uh, a lot of that uh, people say, well, why why use that? Um, I typically use it from a friction reducing standpoint and also from like the corrosion resistance. I mean, the steel itself is very corrosion resistant, but adding that extra layer is just kind of a nice thing. And it adds a little bit of lubricity as you're kind of cutting through things. Are you really going to notice it? Probably not. But I, I like that as an element in there as well. I mean, I think you notice the lubricity on the open and close. It, yeah. it, it's so smooth. Uh, but I, what I was going to say before is uh, so many companies have moved to, and and rightly so, I, I applaud this, but G10 only scales because G10 mm -hmm. is a very strong material. Yeah. Uh, but when you do that, it's got to be a little bit thicker, you know, and you can see that yeah. on a, a cold steel recon one, you want it thicker or whatever, beefy like that. Uh, but for something like this, a little, a, a thin layer of G10 next to a thin layer of steel seems like a very winning combination. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think it is at least. So now, what about, lot of, oh, wait, wait, hold, uh, what about the yeah. carbon fiber liners? Why are we not seeing more of that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it was something that, that I had a crazy idea on uh, one day at SOG and, and we did it and uh, tested it out and it worked beautifully. And we came out with a couple of different knives, like you mentioned, like the Kiku and the Terminus. I think we even came out with the Pentagon that had a, a carbon fiber liner and maybe the Vision. Um, I had plans of kind of expanding that out to a, a series of other different knives, but you know, I'm not there anymore, obviously. So uh, you know, who, who knows what, what's going to happen next? You know, I I think if as Pepfol kind of takes off, I'll probably revisit that and and look at that again as well, because uh, I think that there's some merit to having that. Yeah. While why other knife companies don't do it, I don't know. Yeah um that's that's up to them it may be that they don't want to have to deal with the cost of it or i mean machining g10 or machining uh carbon fiber is pretty nasty stuff right i mean mm -hmm. it's very fibrous and you know maybe they don't want to do it i don't know you have to ask him I, i'm not entirely sure but <laughs> all I, right i, I, think I interrupted you before let me know what you were saying before we were talking about the liner uh the the thin steel liner and the thin g10 handle well, something else that I did to kind of help hold it all together, you'll notice that there aren't any like exterior fasteners except for the pivot, right? Oh, yeah. And one of the reasons I did that is because I wanted it to be really smooth going in and out of the pocket. That's also why you have like all these nice kind of curves around the edges. Like if you put your hand in there, there's no sharp edges that you're going to get cut with. Like I had that happen with some other knives where like, you know, you put your hand in the pocket and all of a sudden it just plays open the back of your pinky. Ouch. Um, and so if you look at the entire like kind of profile and the, and the smoothness of it, even like the notch at the top, it's all there so that you get this very smooth, easy kind of experience going in and out. 
Uh, granted, the notch, you can also kind of use it as a, as a grip point if you need to, to kind of get like that three-point lockup that some people like with it. But I mean, there's just a lot of little tiny details. I think the, the what I'm going to call the T-nut on the back here is how mm -hmm. I actually cinch the entire thing together. And that's actually solid steel as well. So uh, with the pocket clip, that's where I'm getting a lot of the strength from the pocket clip is that that T-nut meshes in with the G10 and with the liners uh, to basically make this nice solid connection which then provides you with oh, that, that good place for the pocket clip too, uh, right? I want to see if I can show that off. I didn't notice that until you just mentioned it, but yeah. you can see that little bit of metal popping up from the, um, uh, the this, this. The back, uh, the T-nut yeah. in the back, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you tighten that thing down and it pulls everything, to, it draws everything together basically. Draws the whole handle together, yeah. Which is so cool. So I don't know. There's a lot of little fun things that I put in this in this knife uh, that kind of have that. I, I really especially like how the pocket clip works. I spent a lot of time working on the pocket clip because I remember at my time at SOG, like people hated pocket clips. I mean, they would always break or they'd, you know, tear up your jeans or all sorts of stuff. And so I spent mm -hmm. a good like two or three months kind of working on the pocket clip to kind of get it to a place that I like it. Uh, it has a lot of neat little features in there that I think, um, you know, people might appreciate. Who knows? Uh, I like it. I mean, the fact that it's like flat, I did that on purpose so that it wouldn't like punch holes in like, uh, you know, your chairs or yep. wherever else you're going to be sitting. Uh, the the little kind of inset on the inside actually works to kind of hook uh, the seam. And I did that so that, you know, how you talked about like when you sit down, sometimes mm -hmm. it would like poke out of your pocket. Yeah. This actually will catch the seam for you. So it doesn't. But I also didn't want to have something where it would like, you know, tear your pants up. And so like you can actually get your finger just underneath it and you can lift and then it just it just pulls out of your pocket easy. So there's a lot of, I mean there's I can kind of go on for a long time but there's a lot of little thoughts that kind of went into this where I was like how do you how do you make a better pocket clip how do you make something that's going to to really be good you know it's like something that that most people are like well it's a pocket clip it's an afterthought I'm just going to put it in there but I'm like I I want something that that people are going to be like appreciate and be like yeah, yeah. They thought about that. That's cool, right? Afterthought. I like that. You're not at yeah. SOG no more, buddy. Uh, and, and another <laughs> cool thing is that you look at it, it looks kind of like a sculpted clip, and then you uh, turn it on its side, and you can see that it's uh, a more of a spring clip, which is yeah. what I prefer. I like the aesthetics of a sculpted clip, but the practicality of a spring clip, you got all that there, and you have your beautiful logo, which, by the way, is really cool uh, on it. Yeah. Um, maybe this is... Pardon me. Maybe this is a good time to ask you about the pepper wool name. What does yeah. that What does that mean? Uh, what does it signify? And uh, how, how does it relate to the knives you're designing? Yeah. So uh, it's it's also related to the logo too. So I'll, I'll explain all of that. Um, granted, it's a weird name. I'll give you right. I mean, like when people ask me like what the brand name is, I say pepper wool, and they kind of look at me and they're like pepper wool. Like no weirder than spider co. I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> Uh, but for me, it, it symbolizes like two kind of ethos that, I, that I'm striving for that, that I'm, I'm working on whenever I'm designing a product. So uh, the element of pepper, like when I think of historically about pepper, I think of these guys that like like Columbus who are like literally circumventing the globe, trying to acquire uh, this fruit. And why? Because like it can take this horrible mundane food that they're that they're eating and actually turn it into something exceptional, something that like they want to eat. And so they're looking for that spark of joy, that spark of happiness. They're like, they're looking for, for the pleasure that they get from it. And so for me, I, I envision that as sort of this, uh, for me, innovation really, really, you know, ch checks that off for me, giving them that sort of pleasure, that joy. Like when I hand this knife to someone and they open and shut it for the first time, and they're just like, they're like, that's really cool. Or they, or they play with the pocket clip or, or I'm talking to you and you're just like, man, I, I love that. Like that's the joy that I wanted to be able to bring was sort of some of the innovative ways that, that I approach this and I'm looking at it. And that's what pepper really means for me. Mm -hmm. uh, wool, you know, once again, you, you go back to the, the, the seafaring uh, voyages, right? Wool is this fabric that people have been relying on for, I don't know, millennia or, or more to keep us warm, to keep us safe. And so for me, that embodies like really solid engineered design, right? Something that's reliable, that's capable, that's something that, that you can really be like, yeah, I can trust this. This is good. And so the marriage of those two ideas of having this sort of super reliable, uh, dependable, well-engineered idea combined with like innovation and, and the, the power of that is where I get Pepperwool from. And so I say, hey, 
that works for me. Now, hopefully that resonates for other people, but for me, that's that's why I wanted to name it that, is that combination. I mean, I, I really like the name I until I read your website. I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> and that makes me like it even more. But um, I, pepper wool, it just kind of rolls off the tongue. I think it's a nice yeah. sounding word. And you kind of have to have that too. It can't, it, it can't be just meaningful. It has to also... Um, I don't know. It, it also has to be nice or fun to say. Spider Co. Pepper Wool. Yeah. You know what I mean? It. It. I don't mean to keep coming back to them, but you know what I mean. It's. Uh. It's unusual, but uh, it feels good to say, and it has meaning, and I like that. Well, and to go a little deeper into the meaning, you mentioned the logo. Um. So what I have with the logo is actually, if you look at it, it has sort of like these cross fibers, which we'd have like mm -hmm. sort of with like a fabric, like wool. Yeah. And then the the flex at like the the other points would be sort of like pepper flakes. So that's sort of the combination of the two of those, and that's why uh, I did it the way I did it. That's how I designed it. So it's the symbolic representation of the name, um, for me at least, right? So like I say, hopefully other people like it. I appreciate the fact that you do. Um, I, I think when I was first telling people, they kind of looked at me and they're like, you know, three years ago, years ago when I kind of came up with the idea, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. They're like, after all, really? They're like that doesn't sound like a like a cool <laughs> brand i'm like i'm like oh no it's gonna be cool like oh, yeah. i i'm excited by this so well ll yeah. bean is a great brand it's been around forever <laughs> like what does that mean um so uh, i want to talk about oh here's a great shot that uh jim just put up of this riding in the fifth pocket and it, it looks like it does and by the way i love your clip point design for the dm now that he's got yeah. it up, I'm all distracted. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about, uh, you have this in both knives, uh, right under the flipper tab, you have that that divot, Notch. that little swale yeah. there. What's what's that all about? So I, I, I got to that a little bit, but I'll, I'll explain some more to it. The main reason that I had that divot is because I was trying to reduce the kick height. Uh, mm. Because like when you're putting this, when you're putting your hand in, I wanted to be able to, to reduce the kick height so that I could get like a, a decent amount of motion in order to open the blade, uh, but still get that. The other element that I was I was going for with this is that a lot of times you'll see knives that have like kind of like a, a thumb ramp or they'll have like really uh, aggressive jimping or something so that you can really kind of gain purchase or gain sort of a, what I would call a kind of a three-point lockup on the knife. And what you'll notice with that notch is that if you kind of stick your thumb in there and you can grab it, it actually really locks up in your hand. So if you have to do some sort of stabbing motion or anything else like that, this is something that really gives you that kind of uh, locked approach. Now on, the, on a small knife like this, you know, unless you have really tiny hands, you're probably not gonna get a lot of use out of it. And so primarily, the reason I have it on this one is because I wanted to get that, that reduced kick height going in, right? That's funny, yeah. I was gonna say the exact opposite. I was gonna say on a knife this size with that slender, um, uh, with the slender width, that is very nice. I find that a reassuring spot because I don't have all fingers on it. It's not a full uh, yeah. four finger grip and it's a place where I can, you know, uh, find security basically. Um, but I could see how on a larger one, it's also, it's also uh, useful, but I really like it on the small one because I say a lot on this show, if you're going to make a small knife, it's got to be real fat. But this one is not real fat. It's like real mm -hmm. thin, but it's very secure in hand. And and I, I think it's because of that for me. Yeah. Uh, I, you yeah. know, I really, I really dig that. Now, the one ding I gave this knife when I showed mm -hmm. it off on my midweek supplemental, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a fob or a lanyard. Um, uh, and yeah. and what what I said is if you if you're a dork like me and you really want it you're gonna drop it in your pocket that way which I don't this actually rides in my back left pocket with the clip but you could always use the clip because you have a generous area there you could definitely fit a 550 cord um, thing there and uh, lanyard fans are used to that uh, some uh, Strider fans do that other other knives you know you end up using the the clip for the lanyard if you have to have it. Um, and it's not actually a ding, uh, from my perspective, but, um, well, yeah, I like the option. So, uh, I think my son must have taken, uh, the one I had here. I thought about that when I was first designing these things. So I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to share with you a, a little thing. I, was, I wonder if I have one here. I did design a fob and, uh, it, basically a uh, laser cut out of leather. And then what you do is is you just simply you, you remove the screw and then you just pop uh, pop it down and you put the screw on oh. and then you have this little laser fob. And um, when I 
I've actually had this thing out uh, for beta testing for about the past year. And the interesting thing that happened to me when I when I did that, because I thought that everyone was going to love the fob. I thought they were just <laughs> going to be like, oh, my gosh, I got to have the fob, right? And so I was going to include like both the pocket clip and a fob and be like, okay, you guys can pick what you want. The feedback I got from the beta testers, though, is that they're like, that's a cool idea. I really like that. But then as soon as they tried the pocket clip out, they never use the fob again. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so like when I was reviewing like the, the feedback I got, they were just like, they're like, it's a cool idea. But like, once I use the pocket clip, I'm like, I, I don't want to use it. And I'm like, I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, I'm like, I still think it's cool. They're like, they're like, nah, I just, you know, but I, I still have them. I have like a collection of them. So if you oh, want, maybe Baron, you can't one. please us nerds. We're, we're just like, <laughs> we'll never be happy. But uh, yeah, that's why I said. If you actually really have to have one, the clip is very generous for that. You know, you you yeah. have room for that if it's something. And for me, like, that's the first thing I thought of. Where's the lanyard? And then I haven't even thought of it since the first yeah. time I popped it in my in my back pocket. Um, I think that this has potential to be one of those gateway knives as well. And I think that's okay. a very important role uh, as someone, you know, uh, who's always trying to get other people to carry pocket knives. Um, Sometimes you have to go small. Sometimes you have to go large. Here, check this big thing out or check out this. It's very discreet. You'll never notice it. And I think that this knife, um, because it's so useful and so easy to carry, could be yeah. one of those knives for people. What what do you what do you plan? How, OK, so I know you have the um, the larger one. You have this. Yeah. What's your overall kind of plan for the company in terms of uh, the kind of things you want to bring? once once you're up and running and you've mm -hmm. uh you can move your mind to other other designs what are you thinking oh i've got a number of different things uh i actually have like the the next five years planned out <laughs> uh but i've got um you know a collection of multi-tools that uh, i've got different ideas of, of technology that I've, I, I've had in the back of my head for a while that i want to kind of explore that i think will be really fascinating uh things that are I guess let me start with this. Like, you know, with Merino, I had a specific problem that I wanted to solve, right? The carryability issue. Uh, there are other problems that I see, whether it's in the multi-tool space, whether it's in uh, even kitchen knives, whether it's in other kind of EDC carry things. Uh, there's a list of problems that I have that uh, I have what I believe are rather interesting solutions for that I want to explore. And so with each one of the kind of product families I'm planning on, on coming out with, each one of those is going to address a specific fan or a specific issue that I see or that I've noticed out in the market that I want to say, hey, you know what? This is a problem that people deal with, and I think it can be better. And it's like, here's how I'm going to make it better. And that's that's what I, what I really want to get for. It's it's going to, uh, you know, the 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 gambit of of different kind of products. I've got kind of a broad list. My wife tells me it's too too broad. She's like, you know, maybe in, maybe in 20 years, right? But she's like, she's like, you know, for right now, it's like. You're good with knives, you're good with multi-tools, kind of focus on those things, really develop that and kind of get that going. Uh, she's like, but all the rest of the things, like if you really want to kind of branch out, go for it. So that's that's kind of where I'm focusing on right now. I was like, hey, this is a, a strong area for me. Work on solving some problems here and then eventually kind of expand out. It, it could be a much more kind of broader lifestyle brand is really where I'm going for. I don't well, think I, it's going to be limited to just knives and tools. I, I like that. I like that because I can tell already from this design and from your past designs, that excuse the expression you're not a hipster it's not a lifestyle brand like uh, uh no. where where you're just trying to be cool um you're really trying to enhance people's lives and how they live them uh but i have to ask you what uh because i'm not a daily carrier of multi-tools but i love my swiss army knives i love my yeah. leatherman and they they reside in my bag that i carry but what are the problems you see specifically with multi-tools The biggest, I think the, the biggest kind of problem that, that I'm, I would say this, I wish they were easier to use and I wish they were more, um, I wish they were more designed for purpose, you know, because uh, a lot of multi-tools are very sort of jack of all trades, right? It, it, it is the, it's the best it's the best worst tool for the job that you can get, right? It's like it's like think of, think of like the screwdriver, right? Yeah. Um, it's a screwdriver. Does it does it work on screws? Yeah. Does it work well? No. 
is it good in a pinch if you have nothing else? It's it's essential because if you have nothing else, that's great. But you know, the the, the pain of of using it is sometimes pretty awful, literal uh, and figurative. Yeah, right. And so I'm like, you know, can there be improvements in that area where you actually are making something? I don't know. I, I think there can be. I, I, I'd like to explore that, I should say. I think that there's areas that, that can be explored to to enhance the ability of, of making it so that it's uh, it's better on, on all fronts, from like the, the usability standpoint to the carry standpoint to, you know. Now, granted, they're extremely complicated. I mean, some of the ones that I got to do at SOG, they're difficult little puzzles, right? I mean, you got to fit everything in there together. It's almost like a little origami puzzle where you got to fit everything together and then like kind of unfold it all to, to make it work. So there's... There's a lot of uh, space kind of limitations that you're working with, but um, yeah, I got some fun ideas that I want to, I want to play with in that area as well. Okay. Uh, I, I can see already. I mean, this conversation has gone very quickly um, and I don't want uh, our main listeners, uh, our non Patreon listeners to miss out on this. So I'm going to ask it now. Uh, you were talking about the OTF mechanism that you created yeah. for SOG and that you're, uh, you're still thinking about this and will possibly bring this forward uh, into Pepperwool, especially as Knife Rights does their work. And I live in a state that now I can carry all this stuff. And and that's happening more and more. 37 states, I think, have a full legal uh, reign over automatic knives. So it's it's on people's minds and we love them. But this idea of a no wiggle out the front has only really been approached and achieved by uh, first G and G Hawk, that's a custom yep. knife. You're going to spend, you're going to pay dearly for that. And then Microtech has been talking about and showing off the, the three or four units that they've actually made that don't wiggle. And I'm not dissing or calling out Microtech, but I can't wait to see that finally. Mm -hmm. What is, I'm not asking how you did it, but, uh, tell me about the innovative innovation process and, and how you hope to bring that forward. I was, I think maybe a year or two into my my time at SOG when Spencer approached me with a uh, with an OTF, and so that's what kind of started me digging into it. And uh, I remember after working on that one for, I think about a year and a half or so, I finally get to got to the point where I was like, you know, no matter how precise we make this thing, uh, it's always going to have a wiggle, and it just seemed kind of ridiculous to me that. When you think about like uh, every other folding knife out in the world, you've gotten to the point where you can have a solid lockup. And I'm like, you got to be able to have a solid lockup with an OTF. There's got to be a way to do it. And I remember just kind of sitting there and thinking about it for a number of years, I think probably maybe five years or so after that. And I went out for a walk one lunch and all of a sudden it's kind of got a brainwave of, of how to do it. And I was like, you know, I think it'll work. And so we built up a couple of prototypes um and it did work and i was like oh my gosh mm. this is pretty awesome now it's a secondary system is is how the uh the pentagon otf works it's uh you know the internals are fairly standard for the most part but then it has like a secondary system which then tightens everything up uh just sort of tourniquets it all basically at the end which is great <laughs> that's cool and um and it's neat you know i i got a patent in the works on that which is is a lot of fun um and uh it's it's a neat bit of technology I think the the cool thing about it is that like you know it deploys you you sit there you wiggle it actually the more you wiggle it the tighter it's going to get in, in this particular model. Uh, I was really pleased with how it turned out. I think it it works really nicely. There was a couple of uh, there's like one kind of snafu where you know from a production standpoint the blade edge rubbed uh, on a part because of the, you know, the tolerance stack up when it was getting made, um, but that got fixed I think just before. Just before I parted ways with SOG, I believe there was a, I left them with a fix. I don't know if they implemented it or not, but it's, it was there. Um, but yeah, it's a neat little thing and it, it does what I wanted it to, which was that it's easy to use and it locks up tight. Right. Hmm. Uh, now, is it as, as tight as say like, you know, Gavin's dive? I don't know. Right. I mean, if you wiggle it enough, it's going to feel, I feel like it's, it's a pretty solid lockup. Uh, but like, you know, there's some people out there that, that, that get it and they kind of wiggle. They're like, ah, I can, if I really refund it, I can feel just a slight motion. Right. And I'm like, it's true, but it's a heck of a lot better than anything else you're going to get. You know what I mean? So. It, it reminds me of a lot of, uh, Andrew Demko's locks where, where the more you stress it, the more it kind of, uh, like yeah. an anaconda just kind of locks in and, and, um, 
and it gets tighter. But uh, the, the, I am no engineer, but I, I can see how someone such as yourself would, you might say, well, look at all the automatic pistols in the world. You know, they all slide yeah. like this and they don't have all this play. There's got to be a way to do it, uh, you know, and yeah. and. I don't know. To me, it's really fascinating how engineers think. I work with some engineers, albeit they're electronic engineers, but uh, just the way they think in terms of uh, problem solving and bringing to bear everything else they've seen in their past to to solve a mechanical problem. To me, is it's very interesting, and uh, I don't know. It's exciting to see that it's not it that it's not out of reach that it can yeah, happen. Well, that's the thing. Is that like I think. Um you have to have that mindset, especially if you're trying to develop something new is that you got to be like, you know what, all things are possible. Let's just give it a shot. And you got to just try things. And that's what I ended up doing with this one is that we just tried a whole bunch of different things. Uh, now granted, um, you know, there's also a lot of just kind of, uh, besides trial and error, there's an awful lot of thought and mathematics to go into it too. If you're going to do something complicated like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, I mean, this from a physics standpoint, this is a marvelously complex little problem. I mean, like from, you know, you're doing a projectile motion and everything else. It's it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and I spent, um, you know, I think uh, after I left SOG, I spent a good six or eight months like doing a whole mathematical model of OTFs and, and creating this this very elaborate kind of system to kind of model every single element of it and kind of figure out like the the whole little tidbit, like, I mean, something as simple as like the, the locking uh, tabs that go back and forth, getting sure you get the mass correct with the spring so that the timing is right as it opens and closes. I mean, there's little things like that, that I think most people don't really think about or don't even really kind of ponder, right? And it's just, for me, it's it's fun because you're you're pushing the boundary of what's possible. That's a lot of that kind of spark of joy that I was talking about earlier. And I, I enjoy it. I have I have pleasure from that, from, from coming up with something new and interesting. You know, uh, it, it occurs to me that people like myself, knife fans, or people who just ravenously collect, and I'm not saying I'm irresponsible, but, you know, people, I have a variety of tastes. We're like chimpanzees compared to you because you're <laughs> like, oh, you know, coming up with all the, you know, I don't even know what the problem is, let alone what the solution <laughs> is. So uh, I, you know, uh, I, I keep my faith in people like you um, to, to, to bring these things when you figure it out, I know it'll, it'll become uh, more standard and that's the kind of thing we appreciate. And if we start to, we meaning I'm speaking for the entire knife community now, but <laughs> if we start to, wow, why can't they, it's got too much wiggle. It's like, Oh, remember this is physics, Bob. And you know, nothing about that. And this is mechanical <laughs> engineering. You know, nothing about that. All right. Uh, we're, we're before we go here, tell us about the launch of pepper wool and uh, what what your plans are, what we can expect, and what's uh, what's directly coming. All right. So the brand is live as of now. Uh, I think it, yesterday was my first day being live. Oh man. Um, websites going. Uh, I've already had a, a fairly decent number of sales just from people I know, um, and I'm working on getting the word out. So that's what kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, hopefully, uh, I, I wanted to do it so that hey, if people want to get stuff for Christmas presents or whatnot, they'd be available. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going on right now as we speak. Um, my goal is that hopefully, like if things do well, I'll be able to rapidly kind of start releasing a lot of the other new knives that are part of the Moreno family uh, in 2025. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if at least every six months, uh, there's something new, maybe even faster than that. Uh, and then I've got a whole co like cadre of extra kind of stuff that I want to kind of get out there as well that I think is kind of fascinating and, and fun. I'll be doing different kind of colorways too. Uh, so like, you know, a lot of people liked the kind of blue and white they thought it was rather stunning and interesting yeah. uh, obviously uh, you know i don't think i've ever seen a knife that uses a blue tie knife before this is kind of a uh interesting thing for me to kind of work out how to how to make that happen but i have a, a whole collection of other kind of different styles that, are, that will, will be released in 2025 as well that you kind of get to see so uh, i was saying before we started rolling it's way outside of my my taste to to even like something like with a blue blade this I think it's stunning. I love it. Uh, I thought it was Cerakote. You corrected me. It's Tainai. It's yeah. beautiful. And then with the little green accents and the uh, um, yeah. the classy, just uh, all caps, pepper wool and the green, I, I think it's very, very pleasing. And I love this. Um, also, at, and, and I, I don't mean to be gauche, but these are all 
also within reach. I mean, they're not yeah. uh, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive. Uh, yep. So these are things that people can go to your website and readily get and uh, give away for Christmas or or what have you. Uh, but I I would start before you give it away for Christmas. Anyone who's listening here should just get one and put it in their pocket because. Uh, we're of like mind, and I love this thing. And I love, we haven't even mentioned the blade shape. It's sort of Tanto-esque, uh, yep. Tanto, uh, American Tanto shape, but it doesn't have the compound grind, so you're not dealing with different um, cutting surfaces. It's it's really beautiful. I love it. So that that blade shape, I actually, uh, it's a modified Tanto that I did uh, first on the, on the Seal FX that SOG came out with yes, a number of years yes. ago. And the reason that I did that is because uh, actually goes back to the more traditional kind of Japanese style where the Tonto has actually got a curve to it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that is because of the cutting elements. You actually get a much kind of a nicer belly with that, with that kind of tip. So it actually slices a little bit nicer, but you still have the, the thickness of it for a penetration if you needed it. So it's a nice combination, I think, uh, of a Tonto. It's not the, the, the harsh angular kind of American Tonto that you see a lot of. Um, and I also think this is easier to sharpen, to be honest with you. Um, but that's, that's my own personal preference. I know there's other people that have their own preferences as well. It's also um, got the, so. the really useful third element of the, just the straight the sharpening trial. <laughs> no, no. Oh, well the sharpening trial is great too, because you can sharpen this thing all day yeah. long up till the top of that. Cause it's nice and thin and it's really the plunge grind is perfect for sharpening that all the way up to the mm -hmm. top. But I just meant that, uh, that nice little straight there. That's also yeah. very useful, uh, for all sorts of of chores uh i'm i'm really digging the merino mm and uh I, I cannot wait to see what you come out with next uh baron mckay of pepper wool uh thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast and yeah. telling us about your 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 work and those of you who are patrons uh will get to hear a little bit more of my conversation with baron uh coming up here thank you so much sir i appreciate it thank you for having me it's been an absolute pleasure and i'd love to come back another time so it's been oh. great Oh, you're welcome back anytime, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Baron McKay of Pepperwool, a brand that just launched uh, based on some very, very deep legacy. Uh, we need big brains like this in the knife world, you know, and, uh, not only does he have a big brain, but he has a very, very good eye, uh, design eye. So it's a real pleasure to meet him and to be carrying the Pepperwool uh, Merino MM in my back left pocket. Can't wait to get one for the front right, and I will do that post-haste. You can do that too. Uh, Pepperwool is now live. Go to pepperwool.com and check out uh, what he has on offer there. Uh, be sure to join us next Sunday for another great interview. And of course, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental Thursday night knives, where we all get to sit, hang out and chat and uh, let the week go and look forward to the weekend. I'm Bob DeMarco for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'll see you next time on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.